give me a hug. <laughs> Good morning. I'm so pleased to be here, and the first thing I want to say is that I believe that the most honest people that are out there are people who are living with dementia. So to get that out of the way first and foremost, and I have to start my talk with my parents. That's my mom, Virginia, who was raised in the mountains of West Virginia, and in, she's in the dress that she had to borrow from a piano teacher to go to her senior dance. Then that's my dad, Manfred Gustav Stobie, came over on the boat from Germany. His name's at Ellis Island, and he was in the Air Force in World War II. He was a bombardier, the guy that sat in that bubble in the B-17s. They met at a USO dance. It was only a few days. My dad asked her to marry him. She said yes, and they were married for 56 years. They started to have a family, and they kept having girls. <laughs> they had girls and girls, and they finally had that boy. And they said, there, we can take our family photo now. <laughs> so they took the family photo, and oops a daisy, six years later, I came along. <laughs> and they never took another family photo. <laughs> so here I am. But that family photo is what made my brother dishonest for me for about seven years of my life because it convinced me I was adopted. I wasn't in the family photo. You were left by gypsies. And they weren't just gypsies, they were German gypsies. So anyway, I started my whole life by some dishonesty. This is my dad and I, circa about 1982, if you can tell by the stirrup pants tucked into the white tennis shoes and the fluffy hair. I was a daddy's girl. I followed him everywhere he went. I wanted to dress like him, be like him, do what he did. So when my dad started to develop Alzheimer's disease, something clicked in me. I had to find out more. I really devoted my life to Alzheimer's and dementia. All my acting and theater books and improv came down to the lower shelves, and I started going to every conference and meeting and workshop that I could. And this definition here, of dementia is one that a lot of people may not know, that dementia is a syndrome, it's not actually a disease. It's a group of symptoms that actually affect your daily life. And if you think about it, this was a perfect day for this too. I hope there's nobody too superstitious. All right, so when you think about dementia, it's really this umbrella term. And underneath that umbrella falls all these different kinds of dementias, like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Lewy body, front temporal, vascular. And so if you have dementia, you have to find out which kind you have. That's important because there's different approaches and different medications for each. And so on that umbrella of dementia are all the different types of symptoms. And I started to, let me put that away. Um, find out as much. And right now, when you hear about dementia, the numbers here is that every four seconds, someone is diagnosed with dementia in the world. Every four seconds. 225,000 people in the United States have early onset Alzheimer's, which means that they have it before the age of 65. And 27 years old is the youngest person ever diagnosed. So, it is a global problem. It is something we have to be aware of and, and know about. And probably somebody in this audience, you've been touched by Alzheimer's or dementia. You all have, probably, in some way. Here's a great definition by my friend, Dr. Al Power, who's a geriatrician. He says dementia is a shift in how the person experiences the world around them. And I believe that is true. And I, I want to just chat a little bit about um, what Alzheimer's kind of does to you. Um, both of my parents uh, were diagnosed with Alzheimer's. My dad passed away in 2000, and a year and a half later, my mom was diagnosed. And we moved out to Black Mountain to move mom in with us. And she lived with us uh, for 11 years with my husband and my daughter and our five crazy animals. And she just passed away this uh, past March, two days before her 93rd birthday but she lived a good life, and she actually had a good death. Um, and the blackboard, for some of you who may not have grown up being taught by people who were teachers writing on blackboards, 
My teacher, um, Mrs. Bowen, in fourth grade, I remember it distinctly, she used to write on the chalkboard the lesson. And as she was writing, she had to turn around sometimes and tell Joe, who sat in the back of the class, to Psh, be quiet. And she didn't even have to turn around because she knew it was him. And she'd keep writing and writing. And when she was done, she'd turn around and teach her lesson. And then she'd pick up that eraser and start to erase. But you know, she was keeping an eye back at Joe, so she didn't get everything. She left, maybe some dust here and some words there, maybe a few numbers or a whole sentence. And then all of a sudden she would just stop because he had to stay after school every single day and get detention and he, she knew he would clean the board. So when I think about Alzheimer's, I think about it as the memories of my mom was all that writing that was on the board and that eraser are those plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's. And it hangs out right here in that present moment, and she has breakfast, and it erases it. She doesn't remember she had breakfast two minutes later. Because that short-term memory loss is one of the first things affected. And then it starts to erase, back and back and back and back and back and back. So for a long time in my mom's life, when you said, hey, mom, we're, we're about to go home. You ready to go home? Oh, yes, let's go. And we'd pull up to our big old farmhouse in Black Mountain, and she'd look, and she'd go, you want me to get out here? Because in her mind, she was thinking about that home in Virginia, West Virginia, the log cabin on the side of the mountain. And so I'd say, sure, let's get out here and just go in that house and see what it's like. OK. So uh, that's kind of to think about where that person is on their chalkboard, so to speak, that can make a difference. And society has not been honest with us in what the picture is of dementia. Long time ago, sadly, Ronald Reagan, we saw a picture of him waving goodbye at his ranch house, and then he was gone. We never saw another picture of him until after he passed away. And so that kind of sent a message back then that what do you do when someone gets Alzheimer's? Lock them away. Put them away. It's undignified. We don't want to see it. They sit alone. They gaze out windows. They're drooling in a wheelchair. But that's not true. That might be true in some cases that we need to work on still in nursing homes and make them better. But for the most part, here's some people who are living with dementia too. These people are out speaking, writing books. Uh, Kate Swaffer's latest book is called What the Hell Happened to My Brain? <laughs> it's really good. These people are all out on the circuit trying to tell people how it really feels. So that's another view of dementia. That's not going to work. Let's go right here. So filling in the blanks is perfectly normal for people. That when we look at something and we realize, oh my gosh, oh, we're, oh here, we're driving to here this morning in the rain and someone cuts us off. What do you do? You fill in a story. You make up why that happened. And that's basically what people with dementia are doing all the time. They're filling in these blanks. They're trying to connect these memories on that chalkboard that don't match. But what happens is sometimes they may make sense and sometimes they don't. And I believe that people living with dementia are just the same as you and I. We're really all just trying to get through the, our day, trying to make sense of the world around us, putting those pieces together. So that's a little bit about Alzheimer's. That's been my life for the last 24 years. My other part of my life has been improvisation. And I was performing and doing shows in Milwaukee and Chicago. And I worked for a large organization that had clubs all across the country. And so I would do 8 to 12 shows a week and work in the office and loved it. And kind of thought that's what my life was going to be, is this little peanut butter and jelly and macaroni and cheese life, uh, doing shows and theater. and. Um, but it switched when I found out about my parents. But let's talk quick about improv. So what is improv? This is my husband's definition. The spontaneous revelation of what the imagination presents. This is my definition. <laughs> you can probably pick out the books on our shelves of whose are his and whose are mine from just this definition. So, um, and it is, it's both. It's making stuff up, 
It's spontaneous revelation of what's going on in the world around us. And in fact, you guys improvise every single day. You improvise what you ate this morning. You improvise how you dressed. You improvise when you open the fridge and you're like, well, what am I going to make for dinner? You improvise every day. You just might not do it on stage. And what's interesting is I didn't realize this for a while, at least until my, my mom had Alzheimer's, that the guidelines for how to be with a person with dementia and the guidelines of how to perform improv are parallel. And there's really no rules to either one, but there are guidelines, and if you follow those guidelines, you're gonna do better at either one. And so here are some of those guidelines. And we're gonna just talk about a few of them for the rest of the time I have here. And first one is yes and. And you've probably heard that if you've ever taken an improv class or looked up anything, but yes and is really the foundation of improv. That if someone walks up to you on stage and says, Karen, what a nice duck you have on your head. And I say, no, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. That's not fun to see. That's just an argument going back and forth. But if someone walks up and says, Karen, what a nice duck you have on your head. And I say, yes, and you should see the dance it makes you do when you wear it. <laughs> Now that's interesting. I say yes to that gift of having a duck on my head and I ended it so they can continue on and, and add on to that scene. Makes it interesting. It's the same kind of in the world of dementia in the sense that people with Alzheimer's dementia are getting these no's all the time. They may not be verbal no's, but they are physical no's to where they can't do what you used to do. And even aging, you know, after you know, a certain while, you realize you're starting to get these physical no's, these emotional no's, these mental no's. You just can't remember. You know, it, it, it's just right on the tip, oh, and it's, it finally get it. Or you can't walk as fast as you used to, or run, or exercise. Or maybe for someone with Alzheimer's, their pen pals aren't writing them, or they're not getting visits like they used to. And we, whoops, I'm going backwards. And for us, I mean, how do you like to hear the word no? Do you like it? No, 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 no. No, no, no. We, we don't. But it seems to be acceptable as we age in a many, many different ways. And it doesn't matter how we hear it. It's not pleasant. We don't like it in any way. So instead, if we switch to that yes and, whether it's uh, yes and uh, if you finish your homework, you can have that cookie, or yes and I'd love to go out with you, but I have to go to creative mornings. Sorry, bye. <laughs> nice to see you. But putting that yes and into your life a little bit, it feels good to say yes. It feels good instead of saying no all the time. And it works wonders when somebody is wanting something or, or someone with Alzheimer's is struggling and they hear that yes instead of a no, you can see their shoulders relax and they calm down a little bit and you can add on to it. So it agrees with them, it validates them, that yes and. And then here's another one. Go with the flow. That's kind of the next step of yes and and improv. And I'm going to have you guys practice just real quick. So can everybody just pair up with someone that's sitting next to you? It could be behind you. I don't care. Just pair up. Ready? Pair up. All right. So this is what I want you to do. You're going to tell a story, and all you got to do is back and forth between you and your partner, but you can decide when you speak and when you don't. So for instance, um, come on, just for a second. And so what might happen is if I start a story and I say, once upon a time there was this boy named Joe, <laughs> and he was the cutest thing you ever saw. In fact, he liked to wear clown outfits with dreadlocks. So basically like that, thank you. You can say one word, you can say a sentence, you can say a paragraph, your partner goes back and forth, but be prepared because you don't know what they're going to say, right? But I'm going to even challenge you a teeny bit and make it that this is the picture I want you to tell your story about, okay? And so choose who starts, points at the person, who starts? Who starts? 
All right, you ready? Whoever starts, start telling your story. Go. Did it feel a little longer? So how'd it go? I saw a lot of smiling. I heard some laughter. There was a couple of people who were very serious in their storytelling. But that's okay. But what you just did is you went with the flow. You had no idea what your partner or partners were going to say. And you listened carefully and you responded. You yes-anded them. You went back and forth and back and forth. And that's it. And sometimes we have such difficulty listening to another person to just give that full focus over to them and respond appropriately. <laughs> and so that's the same is that the people with dementia are just wanting to be listened to, too. It's another thing that if you ask them what they need or want, just listen to me. Give them one minute, maybe, of your time. Another improv and Alzheimer's guideline is step into their world. That it's like after that. After the go with the flow, you may have to step into their world. Sometimes we're so busy trying to pull that person into our world that we don't take that time to take this one little step and step into theirs. And we do that in many, many ways. But you've got to be able to just take that baby step into their world. My uh, mom was sitting actually at the dining room table. My daughter was doing homework and my daughter was listening to music on her phone, and the Beatles were playing, which the Beatles are excellent for people with dementia because they repeat over and over, <laughs> right? My mom picked up on the, the lyrics really quick. And so all of a sudden she said, who, who is that? And my daughter said, well, it's the Beatles. And she said, oh, yes, I dated them. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> and my daughter, being the little 13, 14 year old self, oh, you know, when you're a teenager, you want to tell the truth. You want to say, you didn't. There's no way. You know, she wants to spit it out. But she's been around us so long that she stopped. And she said, really? And she said, oh, yes. And my mom's sitting there during her word search, talking. And she said, well, which one did you like the most? And say their names for me. So. She said their names, and my mom said Ringo, because he had the best name. <laughs> so that's step into the, her world. No matter what, instead of saying, Grandma, there's no way that you dated or even met the Beatles. Instead, going along, and not lying, but just going with the flow and stepping into her world, taking that one little step instead of pulling her backwards. And then accept offers and gifts. In improv, we literally say that when someone comes on stage and says, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned, that means they've given me the gift of knowing who I am and who they are. I am a priest, probably in a church, and this is a parishioner. And so that's a gift that is given to us on stage. And we receive so many gifts throughout our life that sometimes we turn them away, we don't accept them, we say, oh, someone gives us a compliment. We were just talking about this earlier. Gives us a compliment. Instead of saying, thank you very much, we say, oh, this old thing I got at the thrift store. Right? Instead of saying, thank you very much for that compliment. Thank you. Or even taking that gift. There's stories and smiles and wonderful moments that we can have with persons who are living with dementia that sometimes we don't recognize them and we push away those gifts. And 
Another rule is commit 100%. If you're performing an improv, you don't, you don't, you don't start to go on stage and then, they, no, I don't, I can't, no, I, uh, you gotta get on stage. You don't go halfway, you go 100%. And if you're with someone who's living with dementia, it's the same thing. They know if you're not giving 100%. And in fact, what's interesting when you go all in is that it's mind, body, and soul. It's completely, and because, you know, 87.5, that is really hard. And 65.4, that's hard. And 34% to get that, that's hard. But 100%, that's much easier. So go all in, no matter what. And then, enjoy. There's so many people that sometimes aren't enjoying what they do, and especially some folks that maybe work in nursing homes or assisted living, and I, I do say, then get out. Don't do this work, it's not for everybody. Being a family caregiver is not for everybody. It's okay. And being on stage and doing improv, it's okay, but you gotta enjoy it. And the thing that I also learned is, one thing about enjoyment is, it can start with just a smile. And that can be so powerful <laughs> to just smile at somebody else. It's contagious. We know what it means. And those smiles can spread no matter if you have language left because of your dementia or because you're on stage and you just completely froze up in improv. That smile can do a lot. And again, enjoy. So are you happy? Yes. Then keep doing whatever you're doing. Are you happy? No. Do you want to be happy? No. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> are you happy? No. Do you want to be happy? Yes. Then just change something. Just change one little thing and start with that. And then be in the moment. And that is like so clear for improv but also that folks with dementia, their honesty is right there. Their edit button is turned off. They are there in the moment with you. One of my favorite <laughs> moments that happened, my mom used to love going to the grocery store and it was a two to three hour excursion. She had to go up and down every aisle, comment on how much Jello was these days. <gasps> 99 cents, I remember when four cents a package. So one time we were at Ingalls in Black Mountain and she likes to push the cart, but I had something, I was looking at the label, and all of a sudden I look over at the cart and she's gone. I'm like, oh, there she is. And she was down talking to this young woman who had these most beautiful dreadlocks all the way down to her back. And I walked up just in time to hear her saying to the young woman, you know, if you just get some better shampoo. <laughs> And the young woman could have said anything. She could have said anything, but that's what I love about small towns. She turned around and she said, wow, well, thank you, such good advice. <laughs> and my mom turned and strutted back to that. <laughs> like, look what I just, I just helped that poor young woman with the knotted hair. That poor thing. So honest. And one morning we were, trying to get out of the house. And I had not got dressed yet, and she had a doctor's appointment at nine, and she kept heading to the door. She got her purse, and I'm going. And I was like, wait, wait, mom, how about another cup of coffee, and how about a cookie? Come sit at the counter, and I'll be, I just gotta run up and get my clothes. Just give me one second. And she just kept heading to that door. And I was like, oh my God, okay, I just have to run up, grab clothes, I'll get dressed down here. Just give me that one second to get some clothes. And it was just, oh my gosh, and then the cat, threw up something and the dogs wanted to be fed and it was just one of those mornings trying to get out the door. So finally, her and I are going out to the door to a doctor's appointment. We get in our car in Black Mountain. We head down the road. We turn down another road and all of a sudden she goes, oh, have you seen that? And I said, what, what, what's happening? I thought I ran over something. I didn't know what happened. And she said, look, did you know there was mountains here? Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> and it made me just stop. 
take that breath. Why was I in a hurry to go to the doctor's office in the first place, right? You have to sit and wait for 45 minutes. <laughs> but it made me sit there and look at her and hold her hands and say, yes, that is beautiful. To be truly in the moment with her and truly be there and be present with this person that if, who went with the flow, who stepped into the world of mine, who always smiled and laughed. And so I think maybe all of us could be a little bit more honest because if people with dementia can, then I think we can too. Thank you very much.